Hi everybody. I said that our text world game would be a good excuse to learn about networking. So this is the first in several videos that will be an introduction to socket programming in Java. As a disclaimer, everything that, that I'm about to say is going to mask a fair amount of complexity that we won't talk about. Um, there will also be a lot of other alternatives to the things that I'm saying that might be better for your particular application. So I'll try and include links in the YouTube description to further reading for people who are interested. But for the moment, just be forewarned that the approaches that we're taking here might not be the best ones for what you're trying to do. Um, and they might not apply to the way that your particular network is configured. So the first thing that we want to talk about is if your computer is going to send and receive information uh, to another computer on the internet, how do the two computers know how to find each other? Like when I send an information over a network, how does, the, how does that information know where it's going? So there's two answers to that question. One is the IP address and the other is a port number. An IP address is a unique identifying address for your particular computer on a network. So you can think about it like street addresses for houses. So if I want to send information to another computer, I have to know what is the IP address of that computer so that when I send the information, I can attach that IP address and uh, the other computers on the internet will know how to route that information. <coughs> Excuse me, how to route that information to the computer that I'm trying to send it to. When the internet protocols were first invented, there were already a whole bunch of small networks that existed in the United States and around the world. And so what the internet actually did was to provide a way for those smaller networks to connect to each other to form a network of networks. Um, and that's what the internet is. So there's one layer more of complexity here. Your IP address for your particular computer is almost certainly only a local identifying number. Um, what that means is that if you want to com communicate with like somebody's laptop in Singapore, um, probably you don't have a direct way of doing that. You're not going to give them, you're not going to use that laptop's particular IP address because the Singapore laptop probably only has un a unique identifying number on its local network. If you want to learn more about how computers on different local networks communicate with each other. Um, you can read in the links for that. But for the moment, just be forewarned that the client server model that we're going to be making, we're only going to be able to run that within our own lab. So we'll, somebody will run a server and the rest of us will be able to connect to it. Um, but it wouldn't work, for example, if you wanted to connect from home. Okay, so if an IP address lets you uniquely identify a computer, you might wonder, well, every computer has a lot of programs on it that need to send and receive information on the network. So you've got like your web browser maybe, um, you've got some streaming music. So if your computer only has one kind of pipeline out to the network and you get all this information into that pipeline, how does each program know if a particular piece of information is intended for it? That's what port numbers are for. So every computer has a whole bunch of ports. These are not physical parts of your computer. Um, these are defined in software only. But a unique port number is assigned to each of the programs that needs to access your network. So if I'm a client trying to log into a game server, not only do I need to tell the game server, not only do, does my client program need to say, how to find the computer where the game server is running, which is the IP address, I also need to say what port on that computer is the game server software intended to connect on. The last piece of vocabulary is the term packet. Um, if I'm trying to send, for example, a music file or an image over the internet, um, that can be a lot of information. And so you don't send all of that information in one continuous stream over the internet. Instead, uh, whatever you're trying to send gets broken up into little small units of data called packets. And the packets all get sent separately. And the path that a packet takes from one computer to another might be different for different packets. So your packets all kind of scatter through the internet and then they get reconstructed on the other end by the receiving computer. Because all the packets get sent separately, each packet needs to include both the IP address and the port number that is the target location that that information is trying to get to inside the packet itself. 
Um, packets also include other information as well. Um, and again, I will send you links in the description if you want to read about them. For the moment, let's take a look now and see kind of what does this look like in Java code. So we're going to be looking at two completely separate programs. One program is running on the server computer. A totally different program is going to be running on the client computer. So let's imagine we have a client at a particular IP and another server on a different IP. When you run your server code, it will need these two lines of code. You'll need to create a server socket object, and the server socket takes as an input the particular port number that that program is going to be communicating on. You can kind of use whatever number you want, but uh, be aware that there are some ports that are already in use. Um, so for example, port 80 is already used for uh, kind of web communication. But if you just choose uh, like 90, 90 or above, that should probably be fine. So when you create the socket server object, um, you assign it to a variable, in my case, incoming. And then incoming has a method called accept. What that does is it kind of pauses the server code on that particular line. And now the server is waiting, listening on that port number for a connection to be made from a client. The accept method is something that's called a blocking call or a blocking operation. And the reason why is because uh, your code is going to pause on that line. If you have more code underneath, the program won't just continue running to those other lines of code. It will stop and it will wait until it receives a connection. This is going to be really important later on um, because it's, it's going to introduce the need for threading when we think about having a client that needs to use that needs to listen both for the server and also listen for the keyboard inputs from a user. So um, just to be clear, blocking operations are not unique to networking. Um, these two lines of code are how you would create a buffered reader that reads input from the keyboard. So there's no network involved here. Um, but the read line operation there is still a blocking one. If I had code underneath that keyboard.read line, that code wouldn't run because the, the JVM would be sitting and waiting until uh, it received input from the keyboard in order to continue. All right, so if that's what the server looks like, let's look at the client side. So this is a completely separate program that's running on a completely separate computer. And I said that in order to establish a connection, we need to know what IP address is the server IP, and also what port is the server program listening on. So in the client program, we'll provide those two pieces of information, and then you create a new socket object that provides the server IP and the server port that your client wants to connect to. As soon as you uh, construct the socket object, a connection is already established to the server. So that's when the server blocking call will continue. As soon as the socket is successfully constructed, the server code will then continue with whatever else it wanted to do down there. Okay, so now that we've got a server socket and a socket, the next question is, how do these two objects allow communication to happen? So this is not quite the actual Java code, but this is pretty close. So let's say I've got a socket object called S. S has two methods, get input stream and get output stream. These methods make reader for and make writer for, those are not built into Java. I made those up and you can see what those look like actually in a second. But the idea is if you have an input stream, you can create a buffered reader, which I've called receiver. And then down here, receiver has a read line method. So that's how, for example, my client who has a socket could receive information from the server it would sit there waiting until some information that the, that the server sent was read in by the receiver object. If the socket wants to send information to the server, then we'd use this sender print writer, which came from an output stream from your socket. So you always want to think from the perspective of whatever socket you're, you're using right now. So since we're in the client, we're thinking from the client perspective, and a receiver would be receiving input from the server, and a sender would be sending data to the server. Okay, so here's what it actually looks like to create this, the receiver and sender objects. Um, I'm gonna create a new buffered reader, um, and the buffered reader takes as an input a new input stream reader, and the input stream reader takes as an input the input stream that comes from your socket. Um, for the sender, we make a new print writer, 
which is the output stream from your socket. And this true is about, uh, it's about like flushing the buffer and you can read more about that somewhere else. All right, so here we are. We've got the client code and the server code again. The client code has the IP and port of the server and we use it to create a new socket. And then once we have the socket, we create this receiver and sender so that we can, so that our client socket can send and receive information. Meanwhile, on the server side, we have a server socket, which then sits waiting for connections. And as soon as a connection is established, we save the client as, a, as its own socket. You might be thinking, what if there's more than one client connecting to the server? And that's a great question, and that's something that we'll talk about later. But for now, notice that the accept method can only accept a single connection to a client. So right now, this code only allows one client. And because the client is a socket object, we can do the exact same lines of code that we did in the client code. We can say, all right, let's get the input stream for our client socket and let's get the output stream for our client socket. And so now the servers receive and send, you can think about as being the opposite side from the clients receive and send. So in other words, if the client socket is going to send information, then the server socket needs to receive the information. All right, so now that we've got that, here's the kind of thing that we wish we could do in the client. I want to have some kind of infinite loop, and I've created a keyboard object that will read information from the keyboard. So I want to like wait for the user to type something, and then I'll use the sender variable that came from my socket to send that information to the server. And then I'll wait for the server to send me something back, and then I'll display that to the user and then we'll start the process all over again. The problem here is that both of these read line statements are blocking calls. Um, if I'm sitting waiting for the user to type something, I'm not also waiting and listening for the server to send me something. And if I'm s sitting and waiting for a response from the server, I'm not also reading input from the keyboard. So that's the problem. What we really want is we really want the client program to be listening to two things at the same time. Like I want to be listening to the keyboard to see if anything gets typed and then as soon as it does to send it off. But then sort of in a parallel in a parallel set of operations, I wish I could also be listening to the server and if the server sends the client anything, I'll display it to the user through the screen. So the problem is we don't have a good way of doing that right now because these are blocking operations. So here's the plan from here. Um, this was sort of a conceptual overview, but it didn't have complete code that you can actually just type in and use. So first we're gonna write a single interaction client and server. What that means is you'll run your server, you'll run your client, your client will just receive a single response from the server and then exit. So it's not, you're not gonna be doing a lot of sending and receiving back and forth over time, it's just Connection made, that's it. Um, and that's a stepping stone to an interactive client and server. Because this problem that we just saw where you have where you have these two blocking operations, you're gonna have to learn about threads in order to resolve that problem. And threads let you create multiple parallel uh, streams of execution. Um, so you can do multiple things simultaneously in your program. So that's gonna let us write an interactive client and server where the client can wait for the user to type something and send it and receive and and be more like you imagine a network connection to be. And then on top of that, we'll learn how can the server handle multiple client connections at once rather than just a single one. And then as the last step, we'll put the text world game that you've been making on the like as part of the server code so that that way the client types the game world commands that they want to do. Those commands get sent to the server the server will tell your text world object what your particular player wants to do, and whatever the text world game sends as response, that will now get sent back here to your client. Okay, so that's the plan. Tune in the next video and see our single interaction client and server.